Early one evening, in a crowd of people, most of them commuters, he happened to see quite by accident. He'd taken a slightly different route that day, having left the building in which he worked by an entrance he rarely used. And this, as he'd recall afterwards, with a fussy precision which had characterised him since childhood, and helped to account for his success in his profession, because there was renovation being done in the main lobby. A man he had not seen in years. Was it decades? A face teasingly familiar, yet made strange by time, like an old photograph about to disintegrate into its elements. Spence followed the man into the street, into a blousy, damp dusk, but did not catch up with him and introduce himself. That wasn't his way. He was certain he knew the man, and that the man knew him. But how, or why, or from what period in his life the man dated? He could not have said. Spence was forty-two years old, and the other seemed about that age, yet oddly older his skin liverish, his profile vague, as if seen through an element transparent yet dense, like water. His clothing, handsome tweed overcoat, sharply creased grey trousers, hanging slack on him, as if several sizes too large. Outside, Spence soon lost sight of the man in a swarm of pedestrians crossing the street, and made no effort to locate him again but for most of the ride home on the train he thought of nothing else who was that man why was he certain the man would have known him what were they to each other resembling each other only very slightly yet close as twins he felt stabs of excitement that left him weak and breathless but it wasn't until that night when he and his wife were undressing for bed that he said or heard himself say in a voice of amused wonder and dread. I saw someone today who looked just like my cousin Sandy. Did I know Sandy? his wife asked. My cousin Sandy who died, who drowned when we were both in college. But did I know him? his wife asked. She cast him an impatient sidelong glance and smiled her sweet derisive smile. It's difficult to envision him if I've never seen him. And if he's been dead for so long, why would it matter so much to you? Spence had begun to perspire. His heart beat hard and steady, as if in the presence of danger. I don't understand what you're saying, he said. The actual words or their meaning? The words. She laughed as if she'd said something witty and did not answer him. As he fell asleep, he tried not to think of his cousin Sandy, whom he'd not seen in twenty years, and whom he'd last seen in an open casket in a funeral home in Damascus, Minnesota. The second episode occurred a few weeks later, when Spence was in line at a post office, not the post office he usually frequented, but another, larger, busier, in a suburban township adjacent to his own and the elderly woman in front of him drew his attention. Wasn't she, too, someone he knew, or had known many years ago? He stared, fascinated, at her stitched-looking skin, soft and puckered as a glove of some exquisite material, and unnaturally white, her eyes that were small, sunken, yet shining, her astonishing hands, delicate, even skeletal, discoloured by liver spots like coins, yet with rings on several fingers, and in a way, rather beautiful. The woman appeared to be in her mid-nineties, if not older, fussy, anxious, very possibly addled, complaining ceaselessly to herself or to others by way of herself. Yet her manner was mirthful, nervous bustling energy crackled about her like invisible bees. He believed he knew who she was. Miss Reuter, a teacher of his in elementary school, whom he had not seen in more years than he wanted to calculate. Miss Reuter, though enormously aged, was able, it seemed, to get around by herself. She carried a large, rather glitzy shopping bag made of silvery material, and in this bag, 
and in another at her feet, she was rummaging for her change purse, as she called it, which she could not seem to find. The post office clerk waited with a show of strained patience. The line now consisted of half a dozen people. Spence asked Miss Reuter, for surely it was she. While virtually unrecognisable, she was at the same time unmissable, if she needed some assistance. He did not call her by name, as she turned to him, in exasperation and gratitude, as if she knew that he, or someone, would come shortly to her aid. She did not seem to recognise him. Spence paid for her postage and a roll of stamps, and Miss Reuter, still rummaging in her bag, vexed, cheerful, befuddled, thanked him without looking up at him. She insisted it must be a loan and not a gift, for she was, as she said, not yet an object of public charity. Afterwards Spence put the incident out of his mind, knowing the woman was dead. It was purposeless to think of it, and would only upset him. After that he began to see them more frequently, the others, as he thought of them, on the street, in restaurants, at church, in the building in which he worked, on the very floor, in the very department in which his office was located. He was a tax lawyer for one of the largest American conglomerates, yes, and very well paid. One morning his wife saw him standing at a bedroom window, looking out towards the street. She poked him playfully in the ribs. What's wrong? she said. None of this behaviour suits you. There's someone out there at the curb. No one's there. I have the idea he's waiting for me. Oh yes, I do see someone, his wife said carelessly. He's often there, but I doubt he's waiting for you. She laughed as at a private joke. She was a pretty, freckled, snub-nosed woman, given to moments of mysterious amusement. Spence had married her long ago in a trance of love, from which he was yet to awaken. Spence said, his voice shaking, I think, I think, I think I might be having a nervous breakdown. I'm so very, very afraid. No, said his wife. You're the sanest person I know, all surface and no cracks, fissures, potholes. Spence turned to her. His eyes were filling with tears. Don't joke. Have pity. She made no reply, seemed about to drift away, then slipped an arm round his waist and nudged a head against his shoulder in a gesture of camaraderie. Whether mocking or altogether genuine, Spence could not have said, It's just that I'm so afraid. Yes, you said. Of losing my mind, going mad. She stood for a moment, peering out towards the street. The elderly gentleman standing at the curb glanced back, but could not have seen them or anyone behind the lacy bedroom curtains. He was well dressed and carried an umbrella. An umbrella? Perhaps it was a cane. Spence said, I seem to be seeing more and more these people. People I don't think are truly there. He's there. I think they're dead. Dead people. His wife drew back and cast him a sidelong glance, smiling mysteriously. It does seem to upset you, she said since I know they're not there. He's there. So I must be losing my mind. A kind of schizophrenia, waking dreams, hallucinations. Spence was speaking excitedly and did not know exactly what he was saying. His wife drew away from him in alarm or distaste. You take everything so personally, she said. One morning, shortly after the new year, when the air was sharp as a knife and the sky so blue it brought tears of pain to one's eyes, Spen set off on the underground route from his train station to his building. Beneath the city's paved surface was a honeycomb of tunnels. Some of them damp and defiled, 
but most of them in good condition, with occasionally a corridor of gleaming white tiles that looked as if it had been lovingly polished by hand. Spence preferred above ground, or believed he should prefer above ground, for reasons vague and puritanical, but in fierce weather he made his way underground, and worried only that he might get lost, as he sometimes did. Yet even lost he had only to find an escalator or steps leading to the street, and he was no longer lost. This morning, however, the tunnels were far more crowded than usual. Spence saw a preponderance of elderly men and women, and here and there a young face, startling and seemingly unnatural. Here and there, yet more startling, a child's face. Very few of the faces had that air, so disconcerting to him in the past, of the eerily familiar laid upon the utterly unfamiliar, and these he resolutely ignored. He soon fell into step with the crowd, keeping to their pace, which was erratic, surging faster along straight stretches of the tunnel and slower at the curves. He found it agreeable to be borne along by the flow as of a tide. A tunnel of familiar tear-stained mosaics yielded to one of the smart gleaming tunnels, and that in turn to a tunnel badly in need of repair, and, indeed, being noisily repaired, by one of those crews of workmen that labour at all hours of the day and night beneath the surface of the city. And as Spence hurried past the deafening vibrations of the air-hammer, he found himself descending stairs into a tunnel unknown to him, a place of warm, humming, droning sound, like conversation, though none of his fellow pedestrians seemed to be talking. Where were they going, so many people, in the same direction, with only here and there a lone, clearly lost individual bucking the tide, white-faced, eyes snatching at his as if in desperate recognition? Might as well accompany them, Spence thought, and see.